All right, and we are live. So good evening, everyone. My name is Dylan Hosier, and I serve as the Chief Advocacy Officer at the Israeli-American Civic Action Network, or as our friends like to call us, ICANN. Thank you for joining us tonight for a very special event entitled Holocaust Distortion, Massacre of Memory, co-hosted with our friends at the Holocaust Museum in Los Angeles. Before we get started, I wanna say a few words about the importance of tonight's event. Some may be wondering why an advocacy organization that is dedicated to combating anti-Semitism and strengthening the U.S. Israel relationship is so focused on the Holocaust. As an advocacy organization, our work depends on positive and constructive engagement between state and society. Our advocates must have input into government decisions and government must respect the voice of the people while also protecting the rights of the minority. For me and my leadership at ICANN, the Holocaust is a demonstration of the greatest violation of the social contract between state and society. In this case, the state was mobilized to eradicate Jews and other so-called undesirable members of society. This offends every notion of representative democracy and serves as a reminder of how precious our government in the United States is, and that we must always be vigilant and fight and preserve our government of the people, by the people, for the people. I would also like to speak for a moment about the importance of allies, alliances among nations. Good alliances among nations requires trust. If Eastern European nations, including Lithuania, cannot deal honestly with its recent past, how can we fully trust these nations to deal honestly with us today? Tonight, as we examine Lithuania, we encourage this country to honestly examine its past and to embrace whatever truth that examination may reveal. This necessary and courageous act will enable it to go forth into the future free from the burden and deception of trying to hide a dark past. It is also important to note that while in international relations, matters related to security and defense are primary. We must not forget that genocide is often the result of failed policies designed to preserve international peace and security. It doesn't matter how many F-35s or missile defense systems we sell abroad if nations are, alas are allowed to mask their crimes against humanity without consequence. This undermines every other effort related to preserving peace and security in the world. Thank you for joining us. And now we have a brief message from Congressman Brad Sherman. Hello, I'm Congressman Brad Sherman from America's best name city, Sherman Oaks. I want to thank Dylan Hosier, the Israeli American Civic Action Network, and Holocaust Museum LA for convening this virtual gathering. Those who document anti-Semitic incidents, like the Anti-Defamation League, tell us that such incidents are at a near all-time high, and their toll is felt in the death of Jews at uh, the Tree of Life Synagogue, the Chabad of Poway, and the Hypercasher supermarket in Paris. Holocaust denial is, of course, one of the most pernicious forms of anti-Semitism. Holocaust denial is not about uh, history. It's an affirmative statement that the genocide of the Jewish people, as well as the Roma people, homosexuals and those with disabilities, to name just some of the victims, it doesn't matter. But we know it does matter. Not just to remember our past, but to ensure never again. That's why I co-sponsored the Never Again Education Act, which will authorize billions of dollars for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum to ensure widespread Holocaust education. This bill became law last May. I've been dedicated to fighting anti-Semitism wherever it exists, including our own communities locally and on our college campuses. And as a senior member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I've worked to confront it internationally. I've been particularly concerned about anti the anti-Semitic content in Palestinian textbooks, which is a significant barrier to lasting peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Last year, I introduced the Peace and Tolerance in Palestinian Education Act to increase U.S. oversight over the educational materials used in schools by the Palestinian Authority. The bill passed the Foreign Affairs Committee unanimously, and I expect it to come to the floor for consideration this fall. I also co-sponsored the Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat Anti-Semitism Act, which passed the House last year. This would elevate the Special Envoy position to the rank of ambassador to ensure that anti-Semitism issues receive the attention they deserve at the State Department. It's great to have L.A. native Elon Carr currently serving in that role of Special Envoy. In order to combat anti-Semitism abroad, we must know where and how it's occurring. I'm particularly proud of my wife, Lisa, 
who in her former capacity is the deputy envoy on special anti-Semitism at the State Department, uh, who was the principal author of the definitive report issued by the State Department on anti-Semitism globally. That report documented incidences uh, and forms of anti-Semitism, including Holocaust denial, that unfortunately continue to gain traction in Europe and in other places around the world. I know Grant Goshen is with us. Grant worked tirelessly to research the Holocaust and particularly events that transpired in Lithuania. His work inspired me to write the Lithuanian government last year so their Lithuanian allies recognize the darkest realities of the Holocaust, including the role of former Lithuanian Minister of Education, Brez Isis, in the name of the victims and the survivors of the Holocaust. We must remain diligent in the fight against denial and distortion. I will continue my efforts in the United States Congress, and I'm grateful for all of you listening who are part of this effort as well. I'm Congressman Brad Sherman. Great. Thank you, Congressman, for that message. And now we'll go ahead and bring in Beth Keene, CEO of Holocaust Museum Los Angeles. Beth. Thanks, Dylan. Hi everyone, I'm Beth Keen, CEO of Holocaust Museum LA. The museum is honored to co-host today's program, Holocaust Distortion, Massacre of Memory with the Israeli American Civic Action Network. I'm excited to share that on August 28th, we launched a brand new name, logo, and website. Previously called Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, Holocaust Museum LA welcomes a new era. While our name change may seem simple, it represents a powerful decision to put Holocaust education first. We hope to amplify our voice and reach a wider audience with a more contemporary logo and website. In doing so, we will continue our founder's mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire. Holocaust Museum LA is on the path to being a world leader in Holocaust education, as well as issues of inclusiveness and diversity. I invite you all to visit our new website at holocaustmuseumla.org. When the museum pivoted to virtual programming due to the COVID-19 outbreak, we realized we had an opportunity to develop innovative ways to share the history and lessons of the Holocaust with an audience that stretches well beyond our local community and to quickly respond to current events. We have hosted important conversations about anti-Semitism as well as racism and discrimination that the black community faces. We can all learn from the tragedy of the Holocaust and work toward eliminating the hate that unfortunately still plagues our world today. Holocaust education has the power to inspire both students and adults to lead change in their own lives and communities. As the number of survivors who can offer firsthand testimonies of their experiences dwindles, it is so important to continue to have discussions like the one we are having today. Holocaust history must be preserved, especially as anti-Semitism is on the rise. As a museum, our work relies on primary source documents and firsthand witness accounts. I commend today's speakers, for standing up against the distortion of history and fighting for the truth. It is an honor to join you all today. Your work is truly inspiring. I would like to thank Grant Goshen for inviting the museum to participate in tonight's program and Dylan Hosier at the Israeli American Civic Action Network for organizing this important program. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Beth. We're really glad to have you as a partner in this important program. All right, so um, before we get started, I wanna make a note to our viewers. If you have any comments or questions, you can go ahead and uh, type them in the comment box, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Um, if you have questions um, uh, or uh, comments, we'll, we'll put them on the screen and, and maybe answer them. Um, and before we get started with the program, I wanna show you guys a quick uh, rundown of our, um, of our homepage here where we're focused on combating Holocaust distortion and denial. So if you go to this, uh, let's see here, this uh, URL here, israelusa.org forward slash Holocaust, you'll have access to this page. Um, here we talk about why the focus on Lithuania and, and one of our guests, uh, Dr. Zuroff, will explain uh, the importance of Lithuania in this whole discussion. Um, we also have our uh, two of our speakers, Grant Goshen, Sylvia Foti featured. 
I also want to note that we have um, our council of, council of advisors, including Darren Bergman, who is the Shadow Minister of International Relations uh, at the Republic of South Africa, uh, Noel Izon, who is a documentary filmmaker, Dr. Marilyn Kingston, who is a uh, former vice president of the International Network of Adult Children of the Jewish Holocaust Survivors, uh, Edward Dolinsky, the Director General of the Ukrainian Jewish uh, Committee in Ukraine, Dr. Stephen Winmuller, also a guest with us this evening, and who, who is a professor of Jewish communal service at Hebrew Union College. And finally, uh, Ari, uh, Ari Benary Grodinsky, uh, chairman of the Association of Lithuanian Jews in Israel. So we're very proud um, that this makes up ICANN's Council of Advisors on this issue of uh, Holocaust denial and distortion. I do wanna note, uh, if you'd like to stay informed about our efforts, please uh, go ahead and visit this site and, and click here to subscribe to our updates. And very importantly, I want to note that you'll see here um, two books that we're going to be featuring this evening. Um, the first is Our People, Discovering Lithuania's Hidden Holocaust. You can see it here on our page um, by Ruta Vanagaite and uh, Dr. Ephraim Zurov, as well as The Nazi's Granddaughter, um, which was written by Sylvia Foti. That comes out this March, but you can, you can pre-order here. Um, so again, very important to visit this page to stay informed of our, of our efforts. Um, and then I want to make one more quick note, if you'll check out this tweet. Uh, if you know uh, Sherry Daniels, she is the um, uh, State Department's uh, Special Envoy for Holocaust uh, Affairs. Um, just last Friday, she made note of, um, of Lithuania and talked about how important it is um, to address the truth honestly. Um, so she tweeted this, I'll, I'll read it aloud. Lithuania's history is full of proud moments that have led to the flourishing democratic nation it is today. Yet, no country's history is without dark moments. These events must be studied, analyzed, and presented without bias. It is imperative for institutions such as the Genocide and Resistance Research Center of Lithuania to be apolitical and willing to examine history without preconceived notions. Overlooking or downplaying events of the Holocaust creates divisions and tarnishes Lithuania's reputation. The objective analysis of history honors Lithuania's democracy. It's also worth noting, by the way, that Yossi Levy, who is Israel's ambassador to Lithuania, uh, also commented saying, you're absolutely right. The true story, painful as it is, must be told. And so with that, um, I will go ahead and bring in our guests. Uh, okay, let's take this down. So first we'll bring in Dr. Efraim Zurov. And um, we'll bring in Ruta Vanagaite, uh, Mr. Grant Goshen, and Sylvia Foti. Okay, you're all on the screen. We'll take this down. Um, so let's go ahead and, and get started. First of all, did I did I miss anything, Grant? Are we we good on the? <laughs> I think you're great, Dylan. Perfect, outstanding. All right. Um, so first of all, um, uh, Dr. Zurov, if you can go ahead and get us started. Give, give us an overview about um, uh, Holocaust distortion and denial. I, I, as you and I discussed previously, I became acquainted with this issue um, primarily because of Poland's actions a couple of years ago. And that's when I think a lot of us here in the United States understood that there was such a thing as state-sponsored Holocaust distortion. So can you kind of give us the broad overview of this phenomena in, in Eastern Europe? Okay, first of all, I think it's important, first of all, to define and Holocaust distortion. We're not talking about denial, which is an attempt to deny that the Holocaust ever took place or that it grossly uh, minimized. But this is basically an attempt to rewrite the narrative of the Holocaust to deflect blame of certain parties. Now, in order to understand From, what we Dylan, it, it's, it's echoing. Do you hear that? I, yeah, I, do, do you have uh, headphones or how, how are you? Let's see. I don't have headphones, no. Okay, okay. We'll, 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 try, to, uh, we'll try to go through it. Try again. So, so, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. In other words, this is an attempt to rewrite the narratives um, to hide the crimes of certain bodies who were very uh, involved in a very significant way. And this is not only a problem of Lithuania, but Lithuania is certainly one of the major offenders. And this is a problem that is, we see prevalent, rampant throughout post-communist Eastern Europe. Now, in order to understand the origin of this problem, we have to, have to say a few words about the whole issue of collaboration with the Nazis. The Nazis, in all the countries that they occupied and 
the allies as well, and their allies as well, they tried to enlist local helpers. And there were three reasons for that. One ideological reason and two practical reasons. The ideological reason was that they wanted to show that the local population in all these countries um, accept and support the measures that they're about to take against the quote-unquote enemies of the Reich. And we're talking primarily about Jews, but not only Jews, in other words, homosexuals, uh, uh, chronically ill, mentally ill, handicapped, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. All these people who were, who were marked as enemies of the Reich. The practical reasons were the following. First of all, the Nazis were controlling an area in Europe from the gates of Moscow and Leningrad all the way to the beaches of Normandy, from Narvik and Trondheim in northern Norway to the Greek islands, and uh, every, the entire continent basically, with the exception of course of England, and the six neutral countries. In other words, uh, it's Turkey, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, Sweden, and Switzerland. But with the exception of those countries, the Holocaust is taking place in, in the entire continent. They are, they are shorthanded. And obviously, any person that they're able to enlist helps them do what they're doing. So, in other words, that's very important in terms of manpower. And the other point is that they're about to unleash an unprecedented mass murder operation. They come to a country like Lithuania, Ukraine, Latvia, they don't know the language, they don't know the topography, the geography, and especially in the East, in other words, the areas that were, were part of the Soviet Union, this is individual murder. This is not rounding up people and sending them to gas chambers, but rather murdering each individual. And in order to do so, the logistics of the operation obviously need local help. So just as an example, in, in Lithuania, 90% of the 212,000 Jews murdered out of the 220,000 Jews living under the Nazi occupation were murdered by shooting near their homes. And this is an, an incredibly difficult logistical operation that requires enormous manpower. And believe it or not, we now know that the Germans had less than 1,000 men serving in Lithuania during the Holocaust. So this, this and one other point that I have to point out, which is, I think is very important, only in Eastern Europe did collaboration with the Nazis include but participation in systematic mass murder. In other words, everywhere that the Nazis, every area occupied by the Nazis, every area allied with the, every country allied with the Nazis, the local collaborators initially implemented the first steps of what we call the final solution. In other words, identifying the Jews, instituting all sorts of discriminatory legislation, and uh, ultimately rounding up Jews and putting them on trains or boats, depending where they were, and sending them to be murdered. But those murders took place not in France, Belgium, Norway, Holland, Italy, etc., or Greece. Those murders took place in Eastern Europe, and the people who helped carry out those murders were not only the Nazis, the Einsatzgruppen, particularly in Eastern Europe, but the local collaborators. And this assistance was incredibly, incredibly important because it enabled the Nazis to succeed far more than they could have without the assistance of the local population. Now, when these countries of Eastern Europe were liberated from Nazi occupation, they didn't switch a Nazi occupation with and become liberal democracies. The Soviets occupied Eastern Europe. Uh, certain parts of Eastern Europe became Soviet republics, like the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, uh, Belarus, and, and Ukraine. The other countries were under communist domination. And it was the communists who determined what the narrative of the Holocaust would be. And in this, in this respect, 
one of the things that, that stands out is the fact that the communists refused to acknowledge the unique fate of the Jews under the Nazi occupation. So probably the most famous story, or certainly one of the most important ones, is, for example, the story about Babi Yar. Babi Yar was the largest, two, actually a two-day massacre on September 29th, 30th, uh, 1941, during which 33,771 people were murdered, primarily Jews. And for many years, there was nothing to mark the spot, no way to commemorate the horrific crimes that took place. And uh, in the, I think it's in the early 60s, late 50s, some, there was an initiative in the Kiev municipality to build a football stadium on the site of Babi Yar. Now, luckily, the Russian poet, Yevgeny Evtushenko, spoke out against it and he wrote, he publicized his famous poem, Babi Yar, which was basically a cry by the victims, a cry for the victims, for memory. And then what happened was that a small uh, monument was put up with the following caption, to the victims of fascism. Now that's a very wonderful caption, but it hides two very important uh, things. First of all, the identity of the victims. Who were the victims who were murdered by Biyar? And just as important, who were the perpetrators? So in other words, if, if, if there would be a uh, honest uh, presentation of the narrative, it would be on this site, the, the Nazis and Ukrainian security police murdered their victims, it was primarily Jews, but that's of course not what was written. So, and this is this is this was, happened throughout Eastern Europe. When uh, if you had visited Ponar outside Vilna, where Vilnius, where where seventy thousand Jews were murdered, again to the victims of fascism. If you had gone to Riga, to Rumbala, twenty-five to thirty thousand Jews murdered, November thirtieth, December eighth, nineteen forty-one. Same caption. Mali Trustinitz, outside Minsk, where uh, over 100,000 Jews were murdered. So in other words, it was only when the Soviet Union crumbled that for the first time, these countries had an opportunity to learn the truth, to write the truth, to teach the truth. But the problem was that this truth was very difficult because of the significant participation of their nationals in the mass murder. So at the same time, having said that, the issues of the Holocaust became very important because the major foreign policy objective of these countries was to gain entry membership in NATO and in the European Union. In other words, the major fear of the people, and I, I think it's totally understood, was the fear that the Russians might return. Who can protect them? How can a little country like Lithuania protect itself against the Russian army? And the same for Latvia, for Estonia, certainly. But even Ukraine and Belarus, it's not clear that they, I mean, it's, it would be a monumental task to be able to defend themselves. So who can defend them? European Union and NATO. And they understood, or in their minds, uh, fixing, sort of fixing the relationship with the Jews would be an important element the Jews, in this case, means Israel and the Jewish communities, particularly the American Jewish community. Uh, this would be an important way of protecting themselves and ensuring their democratic and independent future, which is totally logical. So what were the issues that these countries faced? They faced the issue of acknowledgement of guilt, commemoration of the victims, um, they, they faced the, the issue of uh, prosecution of those guilty, rewriting the history, rewriting the textbooks, and, uh, and, and restitution. And the issue or the topic that colors everything here and basically determines exactly what will be written here is the narrative. So what was the narrative? So I'll just tell you one brief story, and then I'll say a few words about the book and turn it over to Ruta. Okay. Um, the, um, there was a new monument 
that was dedicated at Ponar in late June 1991. And uh, it replaced the small monument with, to the victims of fascism. And the keynote speaker was Gediminas Vagnorius, the, at that time the Lithuanian prime minister, who said the following. He said, all of this indicating the Holocaust took place in an island in, the, in a very brief time, something like three months. Okay, so we all know it took three years. The real problem was that he said, the misdeeds or the crimes of a small group of degenerates of marginal elements of society cannot besmirch the reputation of a country where so much was done to save the Jews. Now, anyone who knows the history, on one hand, cherishes the, the acts of the righteous Gentiles and the well Lithuanian righteous Gentiles. But I mean, the evidence is overwhelming in terms of the participation of Lithuanians in the murders. So that was basically an indication that already in 1991, the narrative was going to be a false narrative. And I'm sorry to say that from the point of view of the government, nothing, nothing has changed. So one of the things that we did, and, I, and, I, and in that respect, Ruta is the one who was the initiator and deserves uh, practically all the credit, was to write a book about the issue of complicity. We went on admission to 40 places of mass murder where Lithuanians were participants in the mass murder. And we went to see if the places are marked. Many of them are marked. But there are some that are, and there's certainly many that are neglected. We interviewed eyewitnesses, and invariably the answer to our question, who committed the murder, was the Lithuanians. And we went to local museums to see what's recorded, and all of this resulted in the book, and I'll, I'll leave it to Ruta uh, to, to tell her story, which I think is absolutely uh, incredible, and also some, something a very special story, because what part of her motivation was the fact that she discovered that her relatives had been involved. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zaref. Um, uh, we'll go to Ruta, and before we go to Sylvia and Grant, I want to get back to you on the issue of um, distortion post-independence. Mm -hmm. And also, you, you've discussed in previous presentations about how Lithuania really is the engine. Uh, if we look at it, Holocaust distortion as a train, Lithuania is the engine driving that train. So I want to get back to you on that um, after we hear from Ruta. So uh, Ruta, Hello. <laughs> good to connect with you. Good to see you. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you um, how you got involved in this in this issue uh, and, and about your story of of discovery in Lithuania. Yeah. Okay, pure accident. So I am uh, ethnic Lithuania, not a drop of Jewish blood. I was never involved uh, with the Holocaust or the history, and I'm a writer. I used to be a very popular writer here in Lithuania. And uh, like I was born in the Soviet Union, and in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, we never heard the word Holocaust. Okay, there was a murder of Soviet, a peace loving Soviet citizen. I never had a Jewish friend. I hardly met any Jew because in Lithuania we had 200,000 Jews. And when I was born, they were like about a couple of thousand there, maybe more. But we Lithuanians, we were staying separately from the Jews. So if you talk to people of my generation who were born in the Soviet Union and then were living in independent Lithuania, so they would say that, I mean, we, are, we don't care about the Jews. We don't know much about them. They might They might be, you know, like, Many of them were communists, and if they were murdered by by the Nazis, of course not by our people. So because they were com they were communists, and uh, if you ask people on the street, they would say that Jews got they were deserved because they were de deporting uh, deporting Lithuanians to Siberia. This is this is the indifferent indifference I was raised with, and indifference I was living with. So, and my indifference I think was because I was ignorant. And many people were ignorant, even my children, who were raised in independent Lithuania. They, in the school of independent Lithuania, they had, I think, one or one and a half lesson about the Holocaust. So they never visited any mass murder site and they couldn't care less. And 
Uh, I won't go into the story how I how I got into the subject, but it was a pure accident. One conference when I learned from one historian in the in the group of of Lithuanian teachers the real story of the Holocaust that was not taught to us or was not taught to my children about the massive involvement of uh, of Lithuanian people and that when the uh, they were not Nazis who were murdered. We murdered 200,000 Lithuanian Jews, but most of most of the mur uh, killers were Lithuanians, and also that it was not uh, not only uh, not only those people who are uh, killing people at the pits were involved, but it was a massive machine of murder involving a lot of uh, people from Lithuanian government, from Lithuanian municipalities, from Lithuanian police, and local helpers. So this came as a shock to me because part of my family were not really killers, but they were in some way indirectly involved in the Holocaust. And then I thought that if my family was involved, if might be things in my house which are taken from the murdered Jews. So this story should be interesting and important for my readers as well. And uh, partly it was a mistake because, uh, you know, indifference I was living with. There are two kinds, uh, two types of indifference. One indifferent is when you don't know, and when you learn, you become involved, you become sympathetic, you become sorry, you, you, you feel a deep compassion to the victims, and you're outrageous about those people who did it. And there's diff another type of indifference, which is kind of defensive reaction to the to bitter truth that it was in Lithuanian history. And you know, like it's it's very well known phenomena in animal world and also in human world, that reaction to big trauma and big stress is in three types of reaction, fight, flight, or freeze. So indifference of uh, part of Lithuanian society is, is this type of reaction, fight, flight, or freeze. The, we know that something horrible happened to, to, to people in our country, we know Deeply, deep, deeply inside, we know that our people did this, and we want to to either to fight this truth, or to run from this truth, or just freeze when this this uh, the word Holocaust or the word Jew is mentioned, and it happens until today. If you if you ask some of my friends or some of my children's friends, if you talk about the Holocaust or say the word about about the Jews, many people freeze and change the subject. Or they fight and they say Jews got what they deserved. Why you are defending the Jews and why you are talking about the Jews because Jews are paying you. So we, we wrote this book together with Ephraim Zurov. I did the work in the archives, a year work reading testimonies of of the murderers, testimonies of the witnesses, interrogation protocols, and that was all the archives in Lithuania open. Anybody can, could have written this book. Lithuanian historians are writing the truth and telling the truth, but it's a, they are scientific books and nobody is reading them. So based on uh, archives of KGB with interrogation protocols of these murderers and the witnesses, based on the things I read in Lithuanian history books, and also based on our trip with Ephraim Zurov, I'm very happy that we did it together. It would have, would have been too hard for me to do it alone. So this was the basis of the book, which everybody would say we wouldn't read. My children would say we wouldn't read, my friends say we wouldn't read, and the publisher said, okay, you are a popular writer, you want to write about the Holocaust, write about the Holocaust, 2,000 copies, and then you write something else, which we were gonna sell for 15, 20, 30,000 copies. My most popular book was sold in tiny Lithuania, I think 50,000 copies or 60,000, it's about the book for women. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, the book came out two years ago, three years ago, and it instantly became a bestseller. It became a bestseller because it was very simple, written in a very simple way, and it, it was shocking. And the book immediately uh, divided country into two parts. I don't know which part was bigger. The part of the people accepted the truth and the indifference became 
com, uh, became uh, like they became more com, com, compassionate about the issue. They start caring. They start talking to their uh, grandparents who were living in these villages where Jews were murdered, and the grandparents were silent for so many years, or maybe whispering about the, the things that they have seen. But part of Lithuania, the official Lithuania, uh, accepted the book with a lot of hostility. And the defense, the defensive reaction of the government and part of the of the Lithuanian society was to fight this book and to fight Ephraim. They were fighting Ephraim and what he said for 25 years. And now I also became the like enemy of the country who joined the Jews and uh, was as if attacking my own country and the history of my own country. So to make this long story short, the book became a bestseller anyway. So uh, instead of 2,000 copies, the publisher published 19,000 copies. And uh, can you imagine the book about the Holocaust was number one bestseller for a couple of months or maybe half a year until something very sad happened. After telling this truth about the Holocaust, I went a little bit further and made a, two years ago, I made a remark about one of the Lithuanian partisan leaders who was a national hero. And I made a critical remark. And one, one morning, Ephraim Zurov was here. I was told that all my books, six titles altogether, 27,000 copies were removed from the bookstores in one hour. So that was a shock to me, but I'm very happy that I didn't give up. I had to leave the country for a couple of years because it wasn't really safe to stay there. It was like not very pleasant on the streets. And one of the Lithuanian uh, national leaders advised publicly that I should go to the to the forest and uh, pray and commit out myself and uh, condemn myself, meaning I should hang, hang myself, I, which I didn't. I went to Israel, stayed there for three years. And uh, now I came back. And I came back not as a loser. I came back with another book about the Holocaust, which I have written with the uh, famous uh, Holocaust historian, the, the best that it is in the world, uh, Dr. Christoph Dickmann from Germany. And we continued the subject. We wrote as if a second part of our, of, of our book with the Ephraim Zuro, which is called How Did It Happen? And of course, no publisher would publish this book and no bookstore will take it. We have like maybe one tiny bookstore which took it. So I self-publish it, but we are selling on internet and it's absolutely wonderful, strong book, which will be one day will be a, in the schools like an ultimate uh, book about the Holocaust. I'm grateful to Ephraim. I'm grateful to Christoph Dietmann. I finished my story of the Holocaust. All I'm doing now, I'm visiting the graves White off. Ruta, thank you for that. I, I, I want to ask you a quick question. Um, can you unpack a little bit about, um, you, you mentioned very briefly that you made a comment about a, a hero, a national hero, um, and this, this resulted in your books being removed. Um, we're we're going to talk a little bit about that, but for people who don't understand, um, wh why was that an issue? What, what, what did this hero do? Can you, can you kind of unpack that a little bit for us, a little bit further? You know what? We Lithuanians, we, are, we have to be proud of ourselves. And the, the thing we are proud most, uh, proud the most is our past and the, the freedom fighters which were fighting so much after the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want them to be pure, uh, to be snow white. And I, like I mentioned some things about the, the biography of this hero, which are not so snow white, or at least I thought that I, we, we, like journalists or citizens, we can ask some questions. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this hero was not only the hero, he was a martyr. And that was a total blasphemy. And the reaction was absolutely uh, incredible. And I think it was a mistake. You know, you should think twice, three times, five times before saying something about important things for the nation. And uh, I think I went in far enough maybe, with the book maybe. about the Holocaust and with this partisan, I went even th further. And so my writer's career was kind of finished in one day. 
Now I have 27,000 books in my garage. No, no place for the bike. Grant, do you want to comment? Yes. Yes, please. I, um, I, I would like to comment on this. First of all, Ruth is not giving herself credit. I think she's the single bravest person in that entire country. The intimidation that she's faced for standing up and speaking out is, is absolutely remarkable and horrific. I stand in, in absolute respect and awe of Ruta van Geiter for, for her bravery. Um, when Ruta says that she spoke out about one of these partisans, it's, it's become a nationalist, almost religion, to revere these partisans. And nobody is allowed to say a word about them. And the government has falsified the record so comprehensively that simply when the Lithuanian government speaks about one of their historical figures, everything that the government says has to be reviewed for accuracy because there is no accuracy by the government. It's, you know, let, let, let me be a little crass. Let's say you took a bucket of milk and you threw a dog turd into that bucket of milk. What the Lithuanian government has done is, is take the entirety of, of the heroes and put them in this bucket of milk and then thrown a whole bunch of monsters into that bucket and said that these are all the national heroes. So when you, when you say this is the common characteristics, well, everything in that bucket has to be called into question. And unfortunately, um, you know, the intimidation that Root has faced, the government threatened me with criminal charges for speaking out about the murderer of my own family. So those that, that try and address history comprehensively and truthfully suffer extraordinary intimidation. Let's but you know what is sad? What is sad? One, thing, one small comment. I don't care. I mean, now nobody attacks me on the streets because three years passed or two years since this uh, the partisan issue happened. But it scared other people. Yes. You know, some young historians could address the issue. Uh, composers, filmmakers. And since what happened to me and what happened, like one of our writers uh, said on the radio interview, what a pity that we murdered our Jews. Two weeks later, he was invited to the police to, to, tell, to tell them, to explain what did he mean. So who needs that, you know? So that is yep. a sad thing that it delayed my courage or whatever you call it, delayed the process of, of, of reconciliation, of healing or telling the truth. I, I, I don't have much time in life to wait for it. Another 10, 20 years, that's it. That much I can wait. Uh, Ruta and Ephraim, there, there's a there's a scene that you guys talk about um, in the book where you visit a family. I believe there were uh, uh, young uh, girls, maybe twins, who were or, or a young family, young girls. And uh, by the time you got there, there was an older woman, and she said that um, they uh, they could hide they could hide their Jewish neighbors, but they chose not to. Is this is this an episode from uh, from either of your from your book? You tell you tell the story because you were crying then. That's the one. Yeah. Okay, we saw a elderly woman uh, leaving a grocery store, and I said to Ruta, "Listen, she looks as if she's someone who may have been alive at that time, and indeed she was." And she started telling us a story that. She was friendly, they were friendly with the Jewish family. Each family had two girls, and the younger one was her age, about seven or eight. And when the decree started against the Jews, so there was a very intense discussion in her home whether or not they could possibly save her friend. So I said, I said through Ruta, I said, well, you probably were afraid of the Germans. She said, no, we could have hidden my friend forever. We were afraid of our neighbors. And she started crying. It was the most heart-rending scene imaginable. It was as if she had never told the story to someone who was sympathetic to what she had gone through. It was like an enormous boulder sort of rolled off her heart. You know what happened with the book? 
like young people start buying the book for their grandparents. Interesting. Those grandparents were silent for such a long time, and that's why that's why that's why who read this uh, nineteen thousand copies? Old people in Lithuania who saw the murders with their own eyes. All right, that's very interesting. Um, and, and, and how do you see that dynamic playing out today, Ruta, between the young and the old, with, with your book and with with future books coming out? You know, I don't know. There's no. I know that somebody is buying the book. I know that people are afraid to talk. And some people are afraid even to buy the book. But the, our we wrote a new book with Christoph. I mean, we are selling it on internet somehow. Sure. People are buying and people are talking about it. Sure. So, so it will. I mean, I will did, never be, be a popular writer anymore. That's I'm I'm doomed. Did, did, but I think that was a price I was ready to pay, and I'm still ready to pay. Being there in Lithuania, do you have hope uh, in the young in the next generation? That, that, oh, that yes. the truth will be embraced? Oh, yes. yes, but I don't have much time to wait until they read my books. Sure, sure. And, and Ephraim, just from a, from a uh, uh, government standpoint, um, how, I, I wanna ask two questions. How pervasive is this um, throughout Eastern Europe and, or, or Europe in general? And is there an example of um, a state that has embraced its past and has um, done what we want Lithuania to do? And what do we want Lithuania to do, by the way? Listen, I'm sorry to say that there hasn't been a single state in Eastern Europe yeah. that has told the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Sure. Uh, Lithuania, I always used to say, was like a locomotive pulling this train because the initiatives, that, the, let's say legal initiatives, laws that were passed, changing the definition of genocide to fit what happened in Lithuania, were all repeated elsewhere in Latvia and Estonia and Hungary. Um, and and th this is, of course, the problem. The narrative is the key to understanding what's going on, and the narrative is a false narrative. Croatia is another terrible example. I, I think that's important just Can to I emphasize. Can give a short comment about this. Go you ahead. know what we Europeans need? We need Israel to be more proactive. If, if a prime minister of Israel would come to Lithuania and said, excuse me, guys, before we have coffee, why don't you remove the, the monuments for the murderers? Why don't you f fix your, your school programs? Israel is silent, and then Lithuania goes away from whatever it tells about the Holocaust. Listen, Ruta, Ruta, as you know very well, I have often repeatedly uh, criticized Prime Minister Netanyahu and the yes. Israeli Foreign Ministry for its failure to do anything about it. And yes. this is part of the problem. I agree with you 100%. So, you know, I, and that's one of the reasons why before we started this discussion, I wanted to bring up this, uh, I'll bring it up again, this tweet from uh, Sherry Daniels. And here we have the tweet from Yossi, Yossi Levy, who is the ambassador to, um, to uh, Lithuania from Israel. Um, so hopefully he's watching and, and maybe he can get some new instructions from, uh, from the ministry on this, on this issue. Uh, we can be hopeful. <laughs> Um, um, uh, Ephraim, I, I want to emphasize one more time for, for those who, who may not understand why we're, we're focusing on Lithuania, um, and, and I think you said it best, Lithuania sets these policies and then other countries uh, follow. So uh, Lithuania sets a policy, uh, then we see it in Hungary, we see it in, in, in other countries throughout Eastern Europe. Um, what do we want Lithuania to do? I, uh, one of the things that I've, I've, I've read the book and I, I see that you have a, a series of um, of uh, I think six uh, asks that you want uh, the, the country to do. Um, and one of them seems to focus on the International um, Genocide Center. Um, and in this center, they, they conflate uh, Nazi crimes with communist crimes. Is the first step that we're looking for with Lithuania is to separate the two and to, to, to make the two distinct and to recognize the uniqueness of each, of each story? This, this is a major problem, what we call the double genocide theory. In other words, if communist crimes are just as bad, if they're genocide, that means that the Jews committed genocide because there were Jews who worked for the KGB. And of course, if Jews committed genocide, how can the Jews complain about the genocide committed by the Lithuanians? Or if everyone is guilty, no one is guilty. So this is a major component of the distortion industry, you could say. Mm -hmm. And this is something. This is certainly something that has to be changed. Okay, uh, I, I want to bring up um, before we move to Grant and Sylvia, um, your book, uh, "Our People." 
Um, so for those watching, please pick up this book. Um, it's it's on the it's on the link as I had mentioned before. You can see it here at this uh, at this link. Um, so please uh, uh, buy the book. And also, Ruta, will you give us um, will you give us a link to your book as well, the new one, so people can buy it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it just it's in Lithuanian. It's now in Lithuanian only, but in uh, next uh, February, March, it will come in the United States in English. It's written in English. We oh, translate it into oh. Lithuanian, but it's original. Originally, it's written in English. How did it happen? Please share it with us. We'll be we'll be happy to ensure that people uh, people buy it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Um, all right. So, uh, Ephraim, any other any other comments before we move to Grant and Sylvia's part of the story? No. Okay. All right. So uh, let's pull in Grant. Grant. So so uh, how did you just let's start from the beginning with you? How did you? Um, get involved in Lithuania. So you are, you live in California, uh, you're South African, your heritage is Lithuanian, but how did you connect to this, uh, to the story? Dylan, my whole childhood, my grandfather used to talk about the old country and the old country was Lithuania. And he used to regale me with his stories, how he fought in for the independence of Lithuania um, his life there, how he served in the military, how he served the nation, and then he left. And I had a fascination for history. Genealogy is my, my hobby, um, history is my hobby. And so I was among the very first tourists that ever went to Lithuania after Lithuania reachieved independence. I wanted to learn about my grandfather's life in context, and I was captivated. Um, I've been to Lithuania, I think, nine times. I started restoring cemeteries and studying history. And one day I was in my grandfather's village um, with, with an academic, and I said, who pulled the trigger? Who, you know, the, the, we met a man in the village um, that was tending the cemetery and he told us how he was cleaning up the hillside and he found two children's skulls. Um, that was obviously from, from the Holocaust and he found these old gravestones that had been pushed out of the, the cemetery into the river. Um, it was tragic. And I went with this academic and we were standing over one of the death pits uh, containing my my family and we were saying Kaddish and I said who pulled the trigger and the academic said it was a man by the name of Jonas Noreka so what do I know I, I write this name Jonas Noreka down I'd never heard of it before I come back to California I start researching and I discover that in 1984 uh, Der Spiegel magazine did an expose that Jonas Noreka was the murderer of, of that region. So that was six years before Lithuania regained independence. And then I read how in 1997, the Lithuanian government named Jonas Noreka, one of the great national historic heroes. And I thought, this doesn't work. There's, there's a mistake over here. So I started making contact with the government and saying, guys, you've, you've made an error. Um, you know, you, obviously you didn't do your research and, and you need to correct this error. But through the process, I discovered that Noreka wasn't the only one. They had a program where they were converting murderers into their national heroes and rewriting their history. Um, and the more I researched and the more I approached the government, the more I realized that this was no accident. It was, it was absolutely deliberate. Um, so I started approaching some NGOs and, and saying, folks, do you know what's going on in Lithuania? Nobody was dealing with it, so I decided to deal with it myself. And, and um, sorry, just to be clear, you, you, you found out who was the murderer of this region and, and you know, most most people who approach the Holocaust and, and, and who, are, who are thinking about the Holocaust in this way probably think you're talking about a, a, a German Nazi. No. And you're not. 
No, there were very, as, as Ephraim said, yeah. there were very few Germans um, posted in Lithuania. Um, the, the murders and the rapes and the brutality started before the Germans arrived um, in the region where my family lived um, in, in the period that they were murdered. There were no Germans. Uh, there's a report uh, titled the Jaeger report that lists the, the, the numbers and the dates of, of the killings. And from the region where my family was, those are not on that report because there were no Germans there during, during that time or, or, or for most of that time. Most of the murders were committed by ethnic Lithuanians who, as Ephraim said, the murders were one Lithuanian murdering one Jew, one at a time, over and over and over again. So I started, I, I started approaching the government and saying, you know, you, you can't do this. There's monuments for Noreka all over. Um, there's, there's, there's monuments for so many of the others that are clearly identified uh, in the West, not in Lithuania, only identified in the West as Holocaust perpetrators, and Lithuania is rewriting the history. So I got no traction. Um, I think between uh, lawsuits and complaints to the public prosecutor, I think I filed a total of 16 lawsuits in Lithuania against government institutions. Every one of them rejected because there is no path to truth inside Lithuania. Um, people like Ruta Vanagaita are ruthlessly intimidated. Um, even from the safety of my home in the United States, they've threatened me with criminal charges. They, I, I, I'll give you another example. In 2015, 19 of Lithuania's leading citizens sent a petition to the government asking them to put a stop to this. The government publicly called them agents of the East, which is Russian agents, Jews, and other stupid people. The intimidation against anybody domestically that tries to speak up on the subject is, it's, it's awful. So, so citizenry don't speak up. Right, so, so just to clarify that again, the government of Lithuania said that anybody who speaks up on this issue is a Jew, just labeled them as a Jew. No, and they said agents of the East. Agents of the is, East. Which is Kremlin agents. Sure, okay. Jews. Okay. Or other stupid people. Or other stupid, and this is, the, this is from the government. This is from the Republic of Lithuania. This was a public statement by the government. Great. So. Yes. So I, I think for those who are watching this, and this happened in 2015, this didn't happen, you know, 50, 60 years ago. This is five years ago. Um, so I hope for those who are watching, this is why we need to engage our leaders in the United States, especially um, uh, the uh, special envoy for combating anti-Semitism. Correct. For, as, as a thought. I mean, this is, this is contemporary anti-Semitism. So I just wanted to make that point. Correct. Well, I mean, you had uh, Congressman Sherman on earlier. Yep. In 2012, uh, the Lithuanian government exhumed the remains of interim Prime Minister Brazaitis from the United States and took him back to Lithuania to rebury him with national honors. Now, at that stage, the Lithuanian government already knew that he had signed the orders to create the first concentration camp in Lithuania. The Lithuanian Historical Institute advised the government not to do it. And Congressman Sherman wrote the Lithuanian government um, a letter um, bringing to the, their attention that Brazaitis was a perpetrator. It had no response. Um, the government later claimed that the US Congress had rehabilitated and completely exonerated Brazitis. It yeah. was a total falsification of U.S. congressional records. Um, we brought this to the attention of Congress. Congress again uh, brought this to the attention of the Lithuanian Prime Minister. 
and I don't believe they've ever responded. This is not just a problem of one or two Holocaust perpetrators. This is multiple and so many, in fact, that it is impossible for this to have been accidental. So, so let's, so, let, let, should, we, should we go ahead and uh, bring in Sylvia? Uh, well, yeah, let, me, let me tell you how I met Sylvia. Yes. So I was suing the Lithuanian government. Um, and I had a researcher that in Lithuania, I had two researchers in Lithuania, um, that were researching the murder of my own family, Jonas Noreka. Um, and we'd already discovered that there was no path to truth within that country. Um, and then one day I'm sitting at my desk and an email comes across my desk and it says, hello, Mr. Goshen, my name is Sylvia Foti. I assume you know who I am. And I knew exactly who Sylvia Foti is because she's the granddaughter of the man that murdered approximately 100 of my relatives. So when I received that email, I, I started shaking. I, I really started having a reaction and I needed to calm down. And so I told Sylvia, yes, I would like to speak with her. And at that, why don't you now bring in Sylvia? So Sylvia, uh, so I, I want you to tell your story and, and I, I w do want to recognize and thank Ruta and Ephraim. You guys have been fantastic. You, you don't go away yet, but um, it's up, you're up early and I wanted to uh, just uh, say how much we appreciate you being on um, at this hour. Um, but so thank you for that. Um, Sylvia, so t please tell us your story. Um, you, you, are, you, are, you live in Chicago. Um, you're Lithuanian. How did you connect to the story? Uh, also, like Ruta, it was an accident. Um, I had no idea about the Holocaust in Lithuania either. Uh, I went to all the Lithuanian school uh, here. I grew up speaking Lithuanian. Uh, I grew up loving my grandfather. I had never known him, but my mother and my grandmother uh, kept him alive for me. And he was a real presence in my life, like like kind of a ghost hovering over our family all the time. And um, I only heard what a wonderful hero he was, how he fought against the communists, how uh, he fought against the Nazis, how uh, he was in a Nazi concentration camp for two years, and then how he got caught by the KGB and brought into the KGB prison and tortured and ultimately executed at the age of 36. So he died a martyr for the freedom of Lithuania. And this is basically all I knew. And um, in the year 2000, uh, by that time, my mom, my mom was tasked by the Lithuanian community here to write the definitive biography of her father. So uh, for like 20 years, 20, 30 years, I've been watching her collect material on him and talk about this. And she's always going to write the book and she's going to write the book and she's going to write the book. And now she's 60 years old and she thinks she has another 20 years to write the book, but she's in the hospital and uh, she's on her deathbed. And I'm visiting her and she takes my hand and she says, Sylvia, you need to write the book. And <clears throat> of course, um, I, I, I couldn't face the fact that she was dying because that would be the only reason she would be asking me to do this. And I said, no, 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 you're going to, you're going to be fine. You're, you know, you're going to come out like you always do. This is just a regular test. And, uh, she says, you have to, everybody expects it. And so, um, you know, I just, I just kind of made a bargain with God and I said, you know, I'll just, I'll say yes to her, but you know, you're going to, you're going to make sure she's going to come out of this. So, um, I said, I said, I will. And she closed her eyes and she went to sleep. And then the next day I came back and she was in a coma and then she died two weeks later. So I'm stuck with this promise 
And um, I start collecting all the material in my grief. And little by little, I'm thinking maybe maybe this is a nice thing. You know, I can connect with my mother. I, I can connect with the homeland. I can connect with my grandfather. Maybe this is a good project for me. And, um, and then in July of 2000, about five months later, my grandmother is on her deathbed. She survived her daughter uh, by five months. And uh, I go visit her. <clears throat> and I say, and she says, Sylvia, how, how's that book? And I said, well, it's going slow. There's just so much material. But, you know, I'm, I'm not going to let it go like mom did. I'll, I'll get it done. And she looks at me and she says, don't write the book. Just let history lie. And I said, what do you mean, uh, grandmother? Don't, you know, what do you mean don't write the book? And she says, yeah, just, there's no need to dig around. And I said, but I promised mom, you know, I, I have to do this. And she did not like that answer. And so she rolled over in bed and faced the wall and uh, her back was to me. So um, both of them, and, th and then within two weeks she died. So both of them wanted to be buried in Lithuania. Um, and uh, so my brother who lives in California, we took their, they, they were cremated. We took their cremains to Lithuania and there was uh, a funeral in the Vindus Cathedral and um, you know, many people who uh, my brother and I did not know came to visit and pay their respects. And, uh, you know, because of uh, my, my grandfather's code name was um, General Storm, you know, because of General Storm. So, um, so we buried them. And then, uh, th then shortly after that, we were invited to visit the school named after my grandfather uh, in Northern Lithuania. And it was, uh, they were doing like a little memorial in his name uh, because he would have been 90 years old and they had the children run races. And I actually took this off my wall. They had like these little med ceramic medallions with Jonas Nureka's name on it, uh, race in his honor. And they wanted me and my brother to pass out these little ceramic medallions. And uh, you know, the kids are like, are you really, you know, the granddaughter of Jonas Nareka? Yes, yes, I am. And um, we, we were ushered into the uh, director's office and he shows us a scrapbook about, you know, articles of our grand, many, many, many articles about him. And um, he says, thank you so much for writing this book. It's so important that you do this. You're such a good daughter. I'm glad that you took this project over for your mother. And I said, yes, of course. How could I say no to her? And why don't you tell me how you named uh, the school after my grandfather? And he said, well, you know, we had this horrible Russian name before and we had to get rid of that. And so uh, after Lithuania got its independence, we wanted a good Lithuanian name. And your grandfather was born in this town in Shukone. And so of course his name came up right away and it was just a natural. And I, and I said, okay, well that, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And I thought that would be the end of the story. And then he takes me and my brother to the side and he says, but you know, I got a lot of grief over naming the school after Jonas Nareka. And I said, what kind of grief? And he said, uh, because of what the Jews were saying. And I said, what could the Jews possibly say about my grandfather? And uh, he said, you know, as if, as if everybody knows this, well, he, he was accused of killing Jews. And I said, what? And I just, I just couldn't believe it. You know, I almost fainted. I, I had to sit down. I, I, you know, my heart was beating fast. I just, this was the very, very, very first time I had ever heard this. And uh, it was extremely upsetting to me. And then he said, uh, but don't worry about it. That's all in the past. Um, you know, it, it's over. Uh, let's, just, let's just continue on with the races. 
So uh, then after that, um, shortly after that, I came back to Chicago and I uh, w- talked to my father and I talked to some of my mother's friends. I talked to my friends. None of my friends ever heard this from my generation, but my parents' generation, they had heard this. And I said, what do you mean? How could you, how come you never told me anything like this? And they're like, well, you know, it's terrible and it's not true. And why would anybody say this to you? And anyway, it's communist propaganda. So, you know, just ignore it. And, um, and I thought, okay. And I did try to ignore it. And, it, and this was the year 2000. And, um, and I thought, it's not true anyway. It's, it's just not true. And, um, and for about 10 years, this is why I understand the Lithuanians, because for 10 years, I was in total denial, too. I loved that story that it was communist propaganda. I loved that story. And, um, but the journalist in me was already thinking, well, I can't ignore it. I can't completely ignore the story. I'm going to have to address it somehow. And, um, so, uh, I thought as I'm going through all the material that my mother left me, you know, all his heroic stuff, 77 letters from the Shinkoff concentration camp, love letters to my grandmother, fairy tale to my mother, uh, 3000 pages of KGB transcripts. You know, I'm going through all this stuff that, that basically, you know, attests to all his heroism and how wonder, what a wonderful man he is. But at the back of my head, I'm like, I'm going to prove he had nothing to do with the Jews. And I'm going to, I'm going to, if I have to address this, I'm going to exonerate him. That's my plan. And, um, and, but then about 10 years into it, uh, I came across this document called Pekel Galva Yatuve or Raise Your Head Lithuanian. And it's, um, it's 32 pages. And uh, inside, it's basically um, a rant against Jews about how uh, Jews should not buy any products, how Lithuanians should not buy any products from Jews. They're the foreigners. They're taking away all the businesses from Lithuanians. They, they've got all the professorships. They've got all the good positions. And, um, you know, uh so it was on and on and on like this for 32 pages. And I'm like, I wanted to burn the thing when I was finished reading it. And I thought, this is not going to help me exonerate him. And, and, and you've, in, in previous writings, you've described this as the Lithuanian Mein Kampf. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. He wrote it in 1933. Mm-hmm. And, and um, Hitler wrote Mein Kampf in 1925. So there were substantial contacts um, and it was a similar nationalist fascism ideology. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't call for the elimination of Jews and he did not call for the killing of Jews. He just called for the economic boycott of Jews. So, so for a while I was, I convinced myself, yeah, it's bad, it's bad, but you know, it's not that bad. Um, but then I came across this book, Masinesh Udinis Lietuvoya, uh, which is Massive Slaughter in Lithuania. And I'm opening it and I'm looking, you know, in the index. My grandfather's name is in there. That's bad. And I open up and, uh, you know, you can't see it. It's just all print like this. But um, the worst document in there and this is what completely changed me this is completely completely turned me around and uh i changed my whole focus after i read this it was uh august 22nd 1941 and um he is already the uh district chief of Cholet, and he's calling for the roundup of all the jews in the Cholet region and asking that they all be brought to the Jagare and that a ghetto 
be created in Jagadit to keep them there. And then, uh, you know, I, I found out that by October, you know, two or three months later, they were all killed. Mm -hmm. So uh, then that's when I said, okay, now, now I'm going to investigate this part of the story, come what may. And, um, and so I went to Lithuania in 2013 and I stayed, and I was uh, there for seven weeks, and I learned I learned lots and lots and lots and lots of things, which are you know all going are all part of my book. But um, here we're just talking about the denial part of it. And um, I was interviewing uh, a historian in Plungia, where two thousand Jews were murdered at the orders of my grandfather, which was again reported in Der Spiegel that Grant had found out. And um, he, that historian had a mother who was alive, you know, who was alive then. And she knew, she had heard from the Jews of the town that Jonas Nareka gave the order to kill the Jews. And so he's a very conscientious Lithuanian and he wanted to report this to the genocide center in Lithuania. You know, it was an uncomfortable fact, but he, want, he wanted to do this. And so he sent them the information and the testimony by his mother. And the genocide center sent him a letter back and said, there are two Narekas. There are two Jonas Narekas who are exactly in Plunge at exactly the same time. And the one that you're talking about is not the Jonas Nareka that you think he is. May I just interrupt for one moment, please? Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. So... That's a fabulous story. There's a, this um, invisible person theory that the Lithuanian that the Lithuanian government has is is a well worn strategy. I, I'll tell you, decades ago, I applied for restoration of uh, my Lithuanian citizenship based on my grandfather, and my grandfather came from a very small village. There were about five hundred Jews, and uh, Lithuania at that stage had a no Jew citizenship policy because they had a restitution law that said in order to reclaim assets, you had to have Lithuanian citizenship. And so if they saw a Jew applying, they would do everything they could to, to decline that application. So when I presented my grandfather's documents, they said in a village with 500 Jews, there could have been two families with the same names. Um, and I couldn't prove if my grandfather was the one in the documents or another hypothetical invisible family with the same names. So the, the strategy, the, the strategy um, Sylvia just, just mentioned is, is a well-worn strategy of denial by the Lithuanian government. The Genocide Center exists to rewrite Holocaust history um, and essentially to, 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 in, to turn history on its head. So I'm sorry, Sylvia, carry on, please. No, 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 we're, we're, we're coming to the bottom of the second hour. So let, let's, um, and I, I want to bring back in Ephraim and Ruta before we, before we close out. So um, Sylvia, go ahead and, and um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, all I was going to say is it took me five years to write the book after that. I finished it in 2018, and then I had to find a literary agent, and then I got my website up, and then that's when Grant's researcher connected with me, and then that's when I called Grant. Great, great. So um, just as, as we wrap up here, I want to bring in uh, Ruta and Ephraim again. Uh, Ruta, when you hear this story, what, what's, what's your reaction? Is this, is this um, something that is pervasive throughout uh, Lithuania? You know, there are two, like, I, I don't like when people say the word Lithuania because there are two Lithuanians. The government's narrative is one thing, but I mean, ordinary people, a lot of them, I don't know how many, they really accept the truth. They are eager to know the truth. And they are like, they are, that's the Lithuania I came back to. So uh, like the government is ma mainly, uh, this is a genocide center, which is 
with every year is becoming worse and worse, starting from the moment when they made a list of 2,055 Holocaust perpetrators, gave it this list to the government, and the list disappeared for another, I don't know how many years. And they are like, with every year, with every step they do, it's becoming worse and worse. But this is not Lithuania I, I came back to, and one day it's going to be ending and finish thanks to people like Grant, thanks to people like Ephraim, like Sylvia, and uh, I hope that Israel will come we'll, to we'll its talk senses to our friends again in Israel. one day. Um, uh, Ephraim, uh, Grant says that the Genocide Center exists to revise uh, or distort the Holocaust. Do you agree? Listen, the, the problem is that the Genocide and Resistance Center is the authorized government agency to deal with historical issues. And by the way, that's across, that's across the board. In other words, when there was a question of prosecuting a, a Lithuanian Nazi collaborator, the case was obviously handled by a prosecutor, but it was passed on also to the Genocide and Resistance Center, which had to give a professional opinion whether or not this person should be put on trial. And uh, I mean, my initial efforts in Lithuania were in that direction. In other words, we were trying to get as many of the people prosecuted, uh, unpunished Lithuanian Nazi collaborators, uh, you know, prosecuted on criminal charges because there were quite a few in the United States, and about 15 of them had been denaturalized and deported. And everyone except one went back to Lithuania. So, in theory, the Lithuanians could have prosecuted them, and among them was some quite high officials, particularly Alexandra Slalekas and Kaziski Mjauskas, who were the head of the Lithuanian security in the Vilnius district. The Lithuanians did everything possible under the sun to prevent those people from being punished. Um, and the Genocide Center plays, plays a role in this. I mean, the, the historical opinions, opinions in quotation marks, or the documents that they produce in response to Grant's, uh, Grant's suits, I mean, they're ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. The Reich has sent the Jews to the ghetto to protect them. They thought their life would be better there. I mean, and, and also other things. And, but what Ruta said is very true. For the Lithuanians, they, what they're trying to do is to reduce collaboration in the Shoah to shooting. In other words, if you didn't shoot, you're not part of it. That's absurd. How, how could they murder 200,000 people by shooting without the help of the people who arrested the Jews, who guarded the Jews, who brought the Jews to the, to the pits? I'm not even talking about the people who took their property afterwards. That's a whole different category, and it's much larger than the people who are doing the shooting. So, I mean, th th this is precisely the problem. And I have, I have, on the one hand, respect for the Lithuanian historians who more or less wrote the truth. But because it's in Lithuanian and because it's scholarly articles, no one reads it. And, and the sad part is it had no influence on the government narrative. And these historians, some of them, I mean, Ruta was in touch with, with quite a few of them, and some were very helpful, but they, they would never go on, you know, on a radio show or on a TV show and tell, and tell what they know. They, they'd be fine the next day. They're um, dependent on the government for their jobs. Right. Um, uh, Grant, one second. Uh, Ephraim, um, a quick question. Uh, when we look at restitution. Restitution is a big topic today, um, especially here in the United States. We had the, the Just Act uh, report that just came out from um, the State Department. Uh, is restitution ever possible in, in Lithuania or in, in Eastern European countries? How can it, in, in, how can it be possible if uh, the true history cannot be uh, told or revealed? Well, ironically, Lithuania is one of the few countries that has passed a restitution law and that is giving restitution. I mean, you can argue in terms of the extent of restitution and is it going to the survivors, for example, which is a problem. And apparently it's not reaching uh, the survivors themselves. For example, here, the Goodwill Foundation that was created uh, supported the publication of Ruta's second book, which is super important. In the first case, in our book, they didn't want to have anything to do with us initially. 
But um, listen, I, I don't want to confuse two two issues. The Holocaust is grand larceny. It's, it's, and it, but it's also mass murder. And the key issue that we have to focus on is mass murder, and not so much on the restitution. The, the, it's a very dangerous, you know, um, uh, here possibility that the more talk about restitution, the more talk will be that for 60 years the Jews tried to convince us to go into the Holocaust because they wanted to give it a bill at the end of the day, which would be a disaster. It would strengthen every anti-Semitic trope that there is. Right. So let, let's focus on the key point, which is the narrative, the historical narrative. In that respect, I think Ruta's book, if it'll get wide, uh, the second book, if it'll get wide circulation, will be an unbelievable tool to be able to explain to the average Lithuanian, to Lithuanian society, exactly what happened. So in other words, our book raised the issue and put it on the table. This book explains everything. I mean, Dickman is an incredible historian, I have to say. He has every angle covered, the German angle, the Lithuanian angle, and the Jewish angle. And if someone wants to understand, really, how did this happen? How did this thing, we're in Lithuania, a country where there wasn't that much anti-Semitism before the Holocaust. And there were other countries which were considered far more anti-Semitic. Look what happened. How did it happen? He explains every development, every decision, why it was made, when it was made, why it was made, who was responsible. And it's an incredible, incredible resource. Ephraim, you have that. Uh, you have a little bit of a uh, Jerusalem internet issue. <laughs> Slow down there, but that's okay. Um, uh, Ruta, I, I I can promise you that um, when your book is coming out in English, we will do our best to promote it here in the United States, and to make sure that our can friends. Can you promote are, it in Lithuania as well? We'll try to promote it in Lithuania as well. I, I I think we're making new friends. I do want to note, by the way, I don't think I noted it earlier. Um, Grant, you forgot to remind me. We did. Um, I did uh, reach out to the ambassador. Uh, of Lithuania to the United States. Um, I invited him to participate in this uh, in this show. I had a very nice uh, conversation with, um, uh, I guess, the, the secretary of the head office, but uh, I, I, they didn't get back to us after after our initial invitation. So unfortunately, they, they weren't able to join us. But yes, Ruta, we'll do our best <laughs> to promote it in, in Lithuania as well. It would be our honor to do so. Um, so Grant, did you want to make a, a, one more comment before we uh, bring no, I, okay, wh wh one more comment. The the Lithuanian Genocide Center exists to invert the, the narrative. Be, be clear what, when you say uh, invert. Be clear when you say invert. Uh, uh, turn murderers into heroes and, um, you know, substitute fiction for fact. Okay. Um, one of the defenses they put forward on, on Noreka was... Uh, Noreka had to be considered completely innocent because he wasn't put on trial and convicted during his lifetime. Um, they went with that one for quite a while until I pointed out that neither was Adolf Hitler nor Joseph Stalin. When I pointed out that their own words exculpated Joseph Stalin of any criminal conduct, um, that comment stopped. There, there is one more thing I'd like people to think about. Um, the Lithuanian government knowingly uh, inverts truth. They, they deliberately lie. And they know exactly who and what Jonas Noreka was. Um, and yet they educate kids in a school named for a monster that murdered probably 14,500 uh, Jews. Imagine in the United States sending your kid to a school named Hitler High. And Johnny and Sally go off to Hitler High to learn their lessons. And these are the values that they're teaching citizens. Imagine what that does to future generations. And they do it openly and knowingly. That's my comment. All right. Let's, let's bring in Dr. Wittemuller. Dr. Wimmuller. Thank you. Uh, we've been introduced this evening to an extraordinary discussion. And I wish to thank Sylvia and Ruta Ephraim, and certainly uh, Grant, and to you, Dylan, as well, for managing this so beautifully. 
Holocaust revisionism and denial really seeks to alter the intention and meaning of the Nazi campaign against European Jewry, arguing in part that the Holocaust is a hoax its proponents label the Shoah a deliberate Jewish conspiracy designed to advance the interests of Jews or the state of Israel at the expense of other nations and peoples. Over the past several decades, this organized effort to deny or minimize the established history of genocide against Jews has expanded beyond the theoretical revisionist journals and writers, and today has become part of government policy and practice as a way to cleanse the record of the perpetrators, as well as their accomplices. What we have heard this evening concerning the behavior and the intentions of Lithuanian authorities ought to be both troubling and challenging, and it certainly speaks to the national revisionism now underway, certainly again in Eastern Europe. The rewriting of history is constructed around the rejection of core facts, and about basic events. Revisionists today are actively denying the participation of their own nationals in the destruction and death of European Jewry. The goal on the part of these nationalist regimes is to reconstruct history. Such political practices and policies are being introduced and supported by governments such as Poland and Hungary, and as we have heard, Lithuania. Each is seeking to create a false scenario of their national history. And in the process of making these assertions, these regimes are seeking to demean, threaten, isolate those journalists, historians, archivists, and others who are seeking to reclaim the truth. In failing to challenge Holocaust denial practices, the world risks the danger of repeating these false claims and thereby allowing the blurring of the lines between truth and falsehoods. We need to ensure that the international community affirms the historic truths in connection with this genocide and call upon those seeking to rewrite these narratives to reject such policies and practices. If such distortions are allowed to stand, an alternative history surrounding the events 1933-1945 will have been created, designed to serve the new revisionist and nationalistic expressions that have and are emerging in Eastern Europe. In Deborah Lipstadt's words, for Holocaust deniers, deniers to be right, who would have to be wrong? The victims, the survivors, the bystanders. The goals for all of us must be the notion of dealing with and rejecting this effort at revisionism. I think that there are a series of tools by which some of these folks have decided to operate. Some of the proponents of Holocaust denial behavior are seeking to simply rehabilitate their nations and the Nazi regime in ways, in a sense, to sponsor and promote national socialism to new audiences and to new generations. Secondly, there are those who advance these revisionist models as a way of seeking to pr promote conspiracy theories about Jews and their efforts to control or manage events. And third, these deniers have and are making attempts to misrepresent anti-hate campaigns and legislation as evidence that Jews are somehow trying to control the mainstream media and international uh, press as well as government practice. We need to challenge these voices. We should note that Holocaust deniers have been successfully prosecuted by Western European and British courts under racial defamation and hate crime laws. These efforts must be continuously affirmed and supported. The denial or distortion of history is an assault on truth. Memory is crucial to how we understand ourselves and our society. Intentionally distorting or denying the historical record ultimately threatens our collective ability to safeguard democracies and the affirmation of truth. Thank you.
Dylan, we can't hear you. Sorry, I'll bring in, uh, 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 turn on your mics just one last time so we can say uh, good night and good morning to those of you other other parts of the world. So again, Ruta th and, and Ephraim, thank you so much for waking up early and and joining us. Uh, we'll we'll see you again soon. Um, really a, a powerful uh, a, a powerful evening for us. Um, Grant and Sylvia, as always, thank you so much. And um, thank you again to the Holocaust Museum LA for um, co-hosting this with us. And, and Beth, thank you for joining us. I also wanna thank Congressman Brad Sherman for sending in a, a, a nice message for us. And Dr. Wimuller, again, thank you for closing us out tonight, this evening. Thank okay. you. Thank you all so much. Thank you.